going to read a story in the Old Testament. Stories are, are important because in stories, God can give us, give us, gives us lessons, gives us insights, gives us instructions, gives us revelation, gives us truth, gives us nugget of information that empowers us as we live our lives. Because we're in the world, the Bible says, but we're not of the world. Our citizenship is not of the kingdoms of this world. We function and we operate and we engage in the world with passion and with purpose and with intentionality. But our citizenship is of heaven. And the, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within us, so what's on the inside needs to show up on the outside. But stories are important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul tells the Corinthians that there are things written in the Old Testament that are examples for us today. And we can learn from them. And so tonight I want us to talk about a story found in 2 Kings chapter 3. In 2 Kings chapter 3, we're going to read the story about four kings. I want to set up the, the story for you so that we don't have to read all the verses. Um, but the story is about the king of Israel called Jehoram. His father was King Ahab and his father had recently died. And as another king also who is a covenant believer in God called Jehoshaphat, and he's the king of Judah. This was a time in the history of Israel, we could say, as a nation, where the kingdom was divided. You had the northern kingdom called Israel, and you had a southern kingdom called Judah. And even though they were not uh, together, they associated with each other. They had a relationship with each other. The northern kingdom was not serving God at the time of this story. And King Jehoram was doing things that displeased God. But the other king, King of Judah, Jehoshaphat, had a heart for God. He wanted to do what was right in the eyes of God. And in context, I told you the story is about four kings. So in this story, in 2 Kings chapter 3, I want to set the context before we read it. So if you don't have your Bible, please go get your Bible. I want you to read and follow the story with me. And with each point, each section in the story, we're going to draw some things from God's word that I believe will speak to you personally in a way that you need today, that you need right now in this season. So in context, so we have, I want you to picture for a moment, if I don't have a map, but let's suppose that you are looking at a map in the Middle East. And this is in this particular time when the story was written. My hand here represents the Dead Sea. The nation of Israel, as I told you, was the northern kingdom, and the northern kingdom was situated above the Dead Sea. Judah was on the west side of the Dead Sea. So you had the northern kingdom, and then the southern kingdom, Judah, was below but on the west side. There is another kingdom underneath, more to the east, called Edom. And then there's another kingdom called Moab, which was east of the Dead Sea. So Israel, Judah, Edom, and Moab. So the king of Israel, Jehoram, his father had died. And the kingdom of Moab, King Shemisha was the king of Moab, had rebelled against the king of Israel. At the time when King Ahab in the northern kingdom was alive, the king of Misha paid him, paid Israel, 100,000 lambs and 100,000 wolves of rams. But when King Ahab died and King Jehoram became king of Israel, the king of Moab said, I'm not paying you anymore. So the king of Israel became very upset and said, I am going to fight Moab because Moab owes me. How would you feel if somebody owed you a lot of money and decided one day, I'm just not going to pay you anymore? You're going to take action, right? Because it's your money. So the king of Israel decides to go to the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And we're going to pick up the story in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 6. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are. My people as your people. My horses as your horses. Then he said, this is the king 
Jehoshaphat, the king that loved God and had a heart for God, says to the king of Israel, well, which way shall we go up? And the king of Israel answers, we're going to go by the way of Edom. Israel, Judah, Edom. We're going to get to Moab by going toward to you and up from the south to get to Moab. And so let's take a look at verse 9. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. So they grabbed the third king to attack Moab. And they marched on that roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. So now, for some reason, they had a plan. plan is failing because now we're going around in circles and we have no water. Try to imagine what that would be like. And then it says in verse 10, the king of Israel, the evil king, the wicked king who didn't have a heart for God, said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Let's stop for a moment here in the story and just take a look at what we can get just from this section of the story. What, can, what is God saying to us here? We have the story of a wicked king going to a good king who loved God and saying, I need you to come and do something for me. And so I want you to know uh, the lesson in this story is you never want to ask people who are walking in darkness which way you should go. Jehoshaphat had no business getting into agreement with the king of Israel. Because whenever you follow people who walk in darkness, you're going to end up in a dry place. You're going to end up in an empty place. Have you ever been in that situation? Perhaps you're in that situation now. You made a bad decision. You decided to listen and follow the advice of someone who does not know God. I'm guilty as charged. I have done that many times. And the lesson is very painful because Jesus said the blind cannot lead the blind. If a person does not know God or a group of people do not know God, those of us who know God should never go to them and ask them, which way should we go? How do we live our lives? Where is our destiny? Tell us who we are. Nor do we have any business supporting their plans that are opposing God, their plans that are uh, opposite to the will of God, and helping them to do what they are called to do as wicked people. So what, what am I saying in this? Lesson one, relationships matter. Relationships matter right now. When you need to make a decision, you may be in a situation right now where you are in a difficult situation, and perhaps you have uh, made choices. Or perhaps you didn't make choices, but others around you who don't know God or are clueless or don't have the wisdom of God have made decisions and you find yourself trapped without water. In other words, without sustenance, without the things that you need to live properly, well, effectively, healthily. I want you to know God has a plan for you. So let's keep reading and find out what happened. We're going to pick up on verse 11. It says, but Jehoshaphat said... <laughs> After, he, after the king of Israel blamed God, because this is what the wicked will do when things get, get bad, right? God must be the one behind it. This was destined. God's trying to destroy us. The wicked and evil will always blame God for their, for their choices. In verse 11, but Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? Thank God for Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat says, look, God has something to say. We've got to find his word. We've got to seek God. We've got to inquire of God. So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here with, uh, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. I've got, I know a man who has a track record. I know a man who has history with God. I know someone who has heard from God, who speaks for God. And Jehoshaphat had, had enough sense to know that when you're in a tough place, you need to go to the source for a solution, the source of light, the source of life, the source of truth, the source of solution. That's what he did. And verse 12 says, and Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. In other words, he's got the word of the Lord. He's consistent. I know him. I've heard of him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom, the three kings, 
went down to him. So they had to go, because we don't find Elijah coming to them. They had to go find Elijah. And sometimes you and I cannot just stay put. We sometimes like shortcuts when it comes to the things of God. We want people to do all the work for us. I want you to pr do all my praying for me. I want you to do all my fasting for me. I want you to do all my reading of the Bible for me. I want you to solve the problems for me. No, there are times that we, now this is a deep dive, so we're going deeper, all right? This is not for the elementary school believers here or the kindergartners. These are for those of you who are listening, who want to go deep into the things of God. If you want the deep things of God, you're going to have to go into deep waters. You're going to have to take those steps where God is calling you and go where God's word and the source of the truth is found. It takes some effort. It takes you being, you know, scheduling it, uh, planning for it, expecting God to, to meet you where you are. But he wants you to take a step. He wants you to exercise faith towards him. So they went down to him, verse 12. And then verse 13, then Elisha, the prophet, said to the king of Israel, what I've had to do with you. In other words, uh, you and I do not have a relationship. Why are you here? And why are you coming to me, basically, is what he's saying. Why don't you go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother? It just so happens that Jehoram's father was Ahab and his mother was Jezebel. He says, listen, you have other places that you're used to going to get your information. Why are you coming to me? And then he says, but the king of Israel said to him, oh, no, for the king has called these three kings together to deliver him to the hand of Moab. So even at this point in front of Elisha, the king of Israel has already taken his position. We are here. God has already determined that he's going to kill us, and that's why we're here. But I'm doing this because of Jehoshaphat. But really, to be honest with you, I'm convinced we're all going to die. People who walk in darkness, let me say this again, people who do not know God are hopeless. If you're looking at your situation, oh, I feel like I need to say this to you. If you're looking at your situation right now and you're a believer, and you believe everything is going to fall apart, you believe that God cannot save you, there is no hope, there is no chance, you've been listening to the wrong voice. I want you to know that when you are listening to people who don't know God and are in darkness, everything is dark. And so if you've been listening to them, if you've been listening to the news, you've been listening to uh, false prophets, or you've been listening to any, your friend, I don't care who they are, but if you feel hopeless today, tonight, this morning, about your situation, I want you to know you've been listening to the wrong voice. It's time to, to go and find out what God has to say. You need to go find out because God is a God of hope. There's always hope with God. And tonight, I'm here to share and to give you hope and to give you a sense that things are going to get better for you. They will, in Jesus' name. So here we have, again, the king of Israel establishing the fact that things are bad. There's no hope. Nobody can help us or deliver us. Verse 14, Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you, nor see you. Let's just pause for a moment here. When you are going to someone for advice who knows God, loves God, it is important that you honor them. The Bible says that when you honor the word of God, it will come forth for you. When you have dishonor in your heart, when you do not respect the word of God, and you have not made room in your heart for God, there will be a block. There will be a wall created. And Elisha is acknowledging this to the king of Israel. But he's also saying the only reason I'm going to be able to share the word of God with you is because of Jehoshaphat. He, I regard, there is, there is a, an agreement between us because we believe in the same God. Who have you been listening to? I'm going to keep asking you. Where are you getting your information? Let's take a look now at uh, verse 15. But now bring me a musician. This is what Elisha said. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. So what's the lesson from this second part? The first one we said, I said to you, relationships matter. Never ask people who walk in darkness, which way do we go? 
Lesson number two from this second part is that God, in every situation, God always has something to say. In every situation, God always has something to say. Hearing God's word matters. Not man's word, God's word. Hearing from God matters for you right now. See, people, God will use people, but if they're not saying words and talking to you in a way that agrees with the word of God, you have to be able to discern what is of God and what is not. And I think we have what we call mixture. You know, the book of Revelation, just for a moment, some of you are familiar with this particular way of, 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 of uh, uh, in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, you can't be lukewarm with me. You can't have mixture of truth and no truth. The lie and the truth mixed together. It doesn't work. Either it's a yes or a no. It's in God's word or it's not God's word. Blending, into, blending it together creates a metamorphosis that compromises God's word in your life. And I'm going to say this to some of you. Some of you are not fully persuaded. You're not fully all in when it comes to God's word. You're, you're saying you, you have uh, the tendency of, I, I love God, but I, I love this too. Uh, there's, there's a group of people we know all over the world who believe, yeah, Jesus is, is a way, but there are many other ways. Not so in the word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. What are you going to do with that? So it's the same thing. There are some things that God wants to tell you that are specific to your situation, but you're going to have to hear his word and not listen to others adding, subtracting, blending in. What is God saying? He always has something to say especially in your situation, right now where you are. Yes, you. Yes, you. I'm talking to you. You're like, are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm saying it again. Yes, you. God has something to say to you in your situation right now, in this season, in this time. So a musician plays, the atmosphere and the environment is created for the anointing to flow because there are environments where the anointing flows. Music is a beautiful way to create an environment for you to hear God, to worship him. And so Elisha hears from God. And what is the message of God? Let's take a look at verse 16. And God says to Elisha, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. What kind of a message from God? Wait a minute. What, what is God saying? Make this valley full of dishes. Before we read, let's talk about what, what, what came forth. The first thing that God says, I need you to do something. I need you to dig into this dry ground and make holes. Now, why is God giving an instruction like that? Has God ever given you an instruction that was foolish and didn't make sense? Lord, all we want to do is destroy Moab. Why are we talking about digging dishes? When you're seeking God, you need to stop and listen. Pay attention. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, I believe it starts. It says, my son, pay attention to my word. Incline your ears to my sayings. That means be quiet. Shut off all distractions and listen. Listen. Listen and pay attention to the instructions of the, of the Lord. Because God has specific things to share to, with you and with me that are personal. He wants to talk to us as a country. He wants to talk to us as a nation. He wants to talk to your family. He wants to talk to you personally about your life and about that thing that you, are, you keep bringing to him. And I hear that. I can see that. I can sense that in my spirit. There are many of you who said, Lord, I've gone to prayer. I've gone to prayer. Prayer is a conversation with God. And I don't know about you, but conversations is a two-way converse, two-way street, right? There's talking and listening. How much listening have you been doing? What is God saying? What is the last thing that you remember God say to you? I'm asking you, yes, I'm asking you to think about that right now. You want God to keep talking, but what was the last thing he said to you? Do you recall? Do you remember? What has God been saying to you? Because God is a speaking God. He always has something to say. 
the only way that we are not aware is because we are not either listening or we're allowing multiple voices to blend in and choke the word of God. When you've got a lot of voices, and I would say that's probably more the reason than any other, too many voices, too many voices. When Jesus talked about the sower sowing the seed, the parable of the sower sowing the seed, he said, a seed, which is God's word, planted in your life, in your heart, cannot produce fruit if you allow chokers, other weeds, thorns, thistles, other things to grow with it. It's a crowded space. Are there so many voices in your life that you can't determine which is God and which is not? God's word needs to be the authority, the primary thing that you hold to in your life. Everything else you repel, you reject, you resist, you refuse, and you make room just for his word. How crowded is God's word? How much room does God's word have in your life? So I ask you again, what has God been saying to you? What has God been saying? Can you recall? Do you know? And so let's keep reading. Make this valley full of ditches. All of a sudden, the instructions from God is in a, can you imagine in a dry, there's been no water. You want me to go to work? I have to exercise effort? This doesn't even make sense. You want us to dig? A, a, a ditch is a narrow channel. Uh, you're making uh, channels, you're digging into the dirt, into the ground. And usually it's a long, narrow channel or holes that you make in the ground. And so they had to dig. And I'm not sure they brought any shovels. <laughs> they were going to war. I'm sure they had some, some uh, you know, knives and arrows. Who knows what they had. But they didn't bring any shovels. Chances are maybe it might have been a shovel here and there. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had to dig with their hands. <laughs> Yes, we're talking about back in the day, okay? And God says, make this entire valley. We're not talking about one or two ditches. We're talking about every place your foot sees, wherever you're standing, everybody get on your knees and make some holes. Why? This is what God says in verse 17. I love this. For thus says the Lord. I love it when it says, thus says the Lord. Not thus says this person or that person. Just to be sure, thus says the Lord. The prophet says, this is coming from God, not from me. I love that. Thus says the Lord. You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And by the way, verse 18, I'm paraphrasing this is a simple thing in the sight of the Lord. What you're asking, what you need is simple in the, in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. God is saying, when you come to me with a sincere heart and you listen to me, you have to have a heart of obedience. God never said what he's asking you to do made, would make sense. As a matter of fact, throughout the whole Bible, God says he uses the foolish things to confound the wise. The story of salvation. Jesus, God became flesh, dwelt among us, died, shed his blood, went on a cross to pay for the sins of the world. It's a foolish message. And yet, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it is the power of God to those who believe that message. That foolish story of Jesus is the power of God to bring salvation and the new birth into the life of someone. Speaking in other tongues. For those of you who speak in tongues or are, co are confused about tongues, why would God choose tongues? The Bible says tongues is a foolish thing. You're saying something that you don't understand. You're talking to God in a mystery. You better believe it. And yet Jesus said on the day of before the day of Pentecost, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, it's a foolish thing. But it is the power of God 
So God loves to give instructions and cause us to, uh, to do and follow certain things that may be so foolish, and yet God says, listen, I know what I'm talking about. And I'm always, I always ask myself this, and I always ask people, why would you question the person who made the universe, made the stars, knows everything, knows the past, the present, and the future? Lord, I don't understand. I don't think you know, let me, let, I don't think you understand what I'm asking. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you're asking. He has the answer and he has the solution. And in this story, we're going to keep reading verse 19 to see what happens. And then we're going to get some nuggets, more nuggets from this, this wonderful story. And he says in verse 19, also, you shall attack every fortified city. So in other words, I'm going to give you the Moabites. You're going to win this war. And when you, when you win, you're going to attack every fortified city, every choice city. You're going to cut down every good tree, chop up, stop up every spring of water, and ruin every good piece of land with stones that they have. And then it happened. Verse 20 is the, the beautiful part. Now it happened in the morning. Mm, in the morning, the very next day when the grain offering was offered. So somehow the king, the king Jehoshaphat, king of Israel, the king of Edom, and we don't know if they participated, but we know that in the morning a grain offering was offered to the Lord. They had dug ditches, and it had taken them a long time to do that <laughs> the day before because it was a dry, barren ground. A grain offering is brought to the Lord. And then I love this part of the scripture in verse 20. Suddenly, oh, suddenly, suddenly, water came by way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. So Elisha says, listen, God's got answers for you. But before you get the blessing, you're going to need to create containers for the blessings. Oh, listen. And that's what I'm here to say to you as you're listening to the story. God is going to do great things for you. However, before he can bless you in the way he wants to bless you or in the way you're asking him to bless you, you will need to create containers for the blessing. You will need to give him an offering of praise and of worship. And when you create, it's kind of like creating something for God to to do what he does best, miracles. You got to be able to catch the miracle. Because if God gives you a blessing and you're not prepared for it, or you have not made room for it, it will come and it will go. Think about this. Let's give you some example. Let's we'll just apply this in your own life for a moment. You're asking God for finances, and you're asking him for, uh, to help you because you really want to be a good steward you owe some bills and so forth. But you do not create an environment or containers for money to come. You don't even have a savings account. You don't have a checking account. You have no room. In other words, you're not making room for that blessing to come. Create atmosphere. Create room. Create containers. Dig some ditches. Will it require a little bit, uh, some effort? Yeah. Yes, it will. Those containers, those ditches we require you to put in a little bit of effort. Yes, it took some manual labor. It wasn't done by angels. These ditches didn't show up on their own. And then what's also interesting in the story is that the way God chose to bless them, he said, by the way, it's not going to happen the way you are used to thinking. How I bless you, listen, how I bless you is not the way you think. So in this passage of scripture, what we can get from that is that obedience matters. How the blessings come is not always the way you and I think. Obedience matters, however, for us to get the blessings. What would have happened if they had not created those ditches and the water came? It would not have stayed. They would not have containers to hold it. You're asking God for children, for a baby. Oh, I see this couple right now as I'm uh, listening to me. You've gone before the Lord. You've sought the scriptures. You read about Hannah. You read about Rebecca, you read about Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1, uh, women who were barren, and you're holding it before the Lord, and they said, Lord, I have a covenant with you, 
and I want to have children. I want my, my, the womb of my wife, or, uh, or, the, or the wife is saying, my womb is, 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 is a container for you, for, for conception, Father. We bring this in Jesus' name before you, okay? Well, there's room, and so what do you want to do? Yes, you, there's physically a room in the womb. Hey, guess what? Is there a room in your house? Have you made a room in your house for that little crib? <laughs> By faith, speak to an ex, a section in your house and say, this is where my little baby will be. Now, don't go spend all your money. I'm not talking about a lack of wisdom because we must be led of the Spirit of God. But there must be a corresponding action of faith. Do you believe God's going to do it? That's the question. You go to a big God and he says, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. He tells you what to do. And oftentimes it's how to receive it, how to be ready to, to catch that blessing. And we oftentimes are saying, well, that's too hard, Lord. You know, I really want the kind of miracle where nothing is required of me. Faith without corresponding action is dead, being alone. It's words, speak, talk about the blessings that are coming that you already have from God by faith. Say, this will be so for me. I will be blessed. God is my father. God is my provider. God is my protector. God is my healer. Tell God, say to yourself, say to the situation that you're facing who your God is. Talk to your situation. And then listen to the Lord and create the environment of obedience. Obedience matters, especially when we're in a situation that's difficult. We want the easy way out. And again, I keep stressing that because the Lord won't let me move on. Many of you have not progressed because you're asking for the easy way. You want something done for you. And God says, I'm waiting on you to do your part so I can send the blessings to you. What is it that, I, that I'm, I, I feel like even as I'm talking, some things are coming to mind. Initially, when a, tr when a truth has been suppressed and the truth starts to come forth, you know, your mind says, well, I don't want to hear that. You know, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> Keep it down. But the Lord is having me do this. Pull it back up. Mm -mm. What is it that you haven't done that you've been asked to do? What is it that the Lord has asked you to do that you need to obey? What is that? For some of you, it's giving. You're asking for money. You're asking for resources. Lord, I need you to bless me. Oh, God, I, I promise if you give me a million dollars, Lord, I promise I'll help the church. I'll feed the poor. And God says, okay, I want you to give a dime on every dollar. Well, okay, let me get back. Lord, I want you to, okay, just giving, being generous, tithing, offerings. I don't, you don't even want to hear teachings on it. You're like, well, that's not in the Bible. That was back in the day, back in the day of Moses. God is saying, you give and I will give to you. With the measure you use, I'll give back to you. That's in the word of God. And some of you are fighting that word. What you sow, you reap. I always, I always say this. I know I'm kind of deviating a little bit, but this is still part of the message. So many times people come to me and they say, I'd like to see more of this in my life. I'd like to see more of that in my life. I had someone share with me recently, um, you know, I work in a department in the church where, you know, I need volunteers. We and, and I get great volunteers. I have volunteers that come in, that work for, for me and my team that come from, like, they'll drive 40 miles to come and serve in the middle of the week for an hour or two. And so I was asked, how do you get these volunteers? They call me up and say, hey, I'd like to serve you. What can I do? I don't even always go out recruiting them. They come. And so... I wanted to give a very intelligent spiritual answer, <laughs> you know. And the answer was, you sow what you reap. You sow what you reap. I loved serving God. I drove far away when I was younger to go and help in the church and help others. And now I'm in a position of authority and I need volunteers. Guess what? They're coming. I don't say this to pat myself on the back. I'm giving, you, I'm giving you the application of God's word, that there are things you do. When I want something to happen in my life that I don't see, let's just get real. I'm going to give myself, I'm giving myself as an example. Whenever I see something in my life that I don't, that I want to see happen that I don't see, the first thing I want to know is, Father, what do, you, what do you have to say about this situation? 
and I don't go to the horoscopes, and I don't have a seance, and I don't go to the people that walk in darkness, and I don't have tea leaves, and I don't, you know, look at the stars and pretend that, you know, and I don't bow to statues and light candles to statues to find out what God has to say. Yes, I'm talking to you. Yes. Yes, I am. The first thing is, what is God, what has God have to say about this situation? I see a lack. I see a void. And I believe it's the will of God for me to have this blessing. I don't see it. What does God have to say? The next thing is, what do I need to sow? See, those are automatically like part of my Christian walk. Lord, what do I need to sow? Because the law of sowing and reaping is forever. It is the first principle of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God operates on seed time and harvest, on everything. Everything works on seed time and harvest. Jesus himself was a seed in Mary's womb. The word of God is a seed in your life. Finances and giving to others is a seed that you plant. I look to put the seed, and I'm looking for good ground. See, it's not just putting seeds anywhere. <laughs> Even the law of seed time and harvest we need to teach on. It's not just throwing seeds randomly. The next thing, okay, I've got good seed, quality seed, Lord. Where is the good ground? And sometimes God tells me to give it to somebody who doesn't even need it. Someone with a lot of money. It's not me understanding, well, they, don't, they already have money, God. Why would you want me to give them more money? Because I said so. And then there are times God says, find the poorest person uh, a few months ago. And again, I'm sharing out of my own life to show you what I've done. Several months ago during the summer, I told my husband, honey, I have to buy some gift certificates. And I went to uh, some of the, the local grocery stores, and I bought some gift certificates, $25. Gift certificates for food from that particular. And then the Lord says, I want you to go to two, diff two, diff two, two to three different places. I, got, I was in the parking lot. We drove in the parking lot. We got, got our mask on. He says, I'll let you know who to give it to. And I had to write a note. What I was supposed to, I had a $25 gift certificate, and then I wrote something about how to believe for Jesus. So it was both a financial seed and a spiritual. And so the gift certificate came with just a little note from me. Hey, God has chosen you today for me to bless. Very simple. I wrote a little note, typed it up. The financial seed I hope will bless you. It's from the Lord. Number two, but the most important thing in your life is Jesus Christ. That's the greatest gift. I'm giving you a financial seed gift, a financial gift, but really the greatest gift is Jesus. And just a very simple prayer. I put it in an envelope, and whoever the Lord gave, told me to give it to you, and I had more than one or two. I think I had about six or seven. Yes, I had to go and get it. It was my money. It wasn't the church's money. It wasn't my husband's money. It was my money. He says, I want you to go, and I'll let you know who. And I'm thinking, oh, here's the lady. Okay, she looks like she could use it. Nope, not the one. And then I'd go in sometimes into the grocery store looking. It's so much fun <laughs> looking for people to bless. Now, I'm sharing this with you. This is something I would do in secret. I'm not, but I, but I want to show you how things work in the kingdom. Sewing. And so I'm looking, and finally I remember seeing a, a, a young man. He was with his, uh, looks like his little brother. I said, oh, he's the one. And so I went, and I said, you know, I kind of felt like it was right. And I said, sir, I would like to bless you. Would you accept this gift from me? Oh, no, lady, I don't accept any gift. And then we walked away. I said, well, I guess he wasn't the one. <laughs> and then there was a, a one, a one particular situation where I saw a, a, a young woman. She was dressed in a way that was very provocative. And I said, ah, honey, you got work to do in your life. You're probably not the one. But the Lord kept drawing me to her. <laughs> the ones you don't think you're supposed to give to, the Lord says, Yep, lady, yep, she's the one. And she was so blessed. I gave to old people that day. I gave to young people that day. I gave to people I didn't know. Here's the point I'm not saying. I'm not trying to say, do not look at Pascal. The point is, God's ways are not your ways, but God's ways always work. And so when you're in a difficult situation, you need to seek the Lord because when you want to have some suddenlies in your life, and God loves to surprise you with suddenlies. And in this season where we don't know what's going to happen at the end of November, we don't even know today 
who will be the president officially? I'm talking about legally, officially. Who will be the president of the United States? We don't know. <laughs> Do you? I know there's a lot of predictions. I'm sure you, hopefully you voted. We really don't know. What's going to happen at the end of November? What's going to happen in December? What's going to happen at the end of the year? Because no one who began 2020 knew what was going to happen at any point in time, not even the church. Didn't know what was going to happen in the school system, the economy, politics, health care. No one saw this. No one. No one could predict all that was going to happen. But I want you to know, you're alive today. God's got a plan today. I want you to know if you're alive today, God has a plan to bless you today in this season, in this day. And God's prepared to give you a suddenly. So today I'm going to close the message by saying this. Hope. Hope is not this maybe. Hope is a, this is what hope is. It's the anticipation of good. It is the confident anticipation of good. It is the absolute confidence to anticipate that God is good and he will be good to you. It's an expectation. It's an it's a absolute, perfect expectation that comes from God. God is a God of hope. I want you to have hope today. I want you to rejoice today, even before. If I told you water was coming, if I told you God's about to bless you, would you get ready? I know I, I would. I'd be like, okay, how do I get, how do I catch it? How do I, how, how do I contain this blessing that's coming my way? That's the attitude I want you to have today. Don't look at the darkness around you. Don't look at the darkness around you. There will always be darkness, but you're a child of the light. And that you are a carrier of the light. And the entrance of God's word gives light. And I hope and pray that God's word in 2 Kings chapter 3 brought light to you. And it's giving you hope today. Because no matter what's going on in the world, God's children always had light. Like in Egypt, Goshen always had light. Even though Egypt had darkness. So three things again. I'm, I'm a teacher, so i got to review. Never ask people in darkness which way to go. Relationships matter who you're getting your information and following and associating with matters. Number two, in every situation, God has something to say. Hearing God's word matters. And then number three, how the blessings come is not always the way you think, but obedience matters. So let's close in prayer. I really believe that you were encouraged today by God's word. Father, we just thank you so much that you are a God of hope, you are a God that loves to surprise your people. You are a God of miracles. Is anything too difficult for you? Absolutely not. And so we have faith in you. We have faith in a God who cannot lie. We have faith in a God who is limitless. The only thing that limits you, God, is our lack of belief and our unwillingness to obey you. And so if we have deviated in any way, we realign today, Father. We realign our ears, our attention to attend to your word, to incline our ears to your saying, to give our undivided attention, to listen with intent to obey. And whatever that you ask us to do, though it may be small and even hard, we're able to do it knowing. See, the reason we do it, because we know you. <laughs> if you asked us to do it, you didn't ask us to do it in vain. You asked us to do it because there's a blessing associated with that obedience. You said in your word, if we are willing and obedient, we shall eat the good of the land. And so I pray for every single person listening to me in this moment, in this season, in this time, that Lord, hope would arise joy would arise in the middle of the storm, in the middle of darkness, light shines. I thank you, Father, that you are glorified in your people. In Jesus' name.